This is Leader to Leader with Dean Fountain from the University of West Florida's College of Business. Today's guest is Allison Hill, Chief Executive Officer for Lakeview Center, Inc., and a Senior Vice President of Baptist Healthcare. Allison also serves in the UWF Executive Mentoring Program and is a member of the Rotary Club of Pensacola. It's exciting to be back at Leader to Leader this week and have the honor of one of my fellow Rotarians, Allison Hill, joining us today. So welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thanks so much for being here. I'm honored. You also served on a committee as an outside member on mentoring. So thank you for all that you do for the University of West Florida. I'll start off by thanking you for that. You know, we're so interested in how is it going? Are you all working remotely? How is that? And it's a year now. How has that gone from your perspective as a CEO? Help me understand kind of reflecting back, if you will, what type of leadership skills do you now think really came out during the early days of either working for home or what we were going through? I'm really interested to hear that. So that's a great question because this last year has been, you know, quite a year. And I think we all have learned things about ourselves and about other people, about the community and just how we respond in times of change and times of uncertainty. It was about a year ago that Baptist had the first presumptive positive case in the panhandle. They kind of changed everybody's world in just a matter of days, you know, a matter of weeks. We actually, within Lakeview Center, within the human services part of the healthcare system, had to go to telework in a lot of our areas almost overnight. And so where we had been doing some remote services prior to COVID, after COVID, probably about 80% of our outpatient behavioral health services were being done via Zoom, via technology. And all of our admin and support services, folks went home and started working from home. We have about 3,300 team members and a thousand of those team members are working from home and still today are working from home, probably through the end of June. There's a lot of lessons learned coming out of that. Our infrastructure was pretty good. And so folks could go home and work and continue to be productive. But, you know, you see a lot about people's styles and personalities, how comfortable they are with technology, how comfortable they are with just voice or a flat picture on the screen versus that personal 3D kind of experience. And so what we have learned about leadership is that in some ways it's been challenging to not be in the same room, but in other ways we have connected in a capacity that we weren't able to before. And I think probably the best example of that, so I have leaders all over the country. We're in 20 states in the District of Columbia. The senior leadership team is scattered. We, prior to COVID, would have a once a quarter in-person meeting for those 45 or so people. And we had, you know, six hours together once a quarter. When the pandemic hit, we started doing a weekly Zoom And it started in the very beginning, just say, here's the status, here's what's going on, how's everybody doing, what do you need, you know, who has masks, who needs masks, you know, those kinds of questions. And then it kind of morphed to where it's just a weekly meeting and people do not miss it because it's a way to connect. Everybody's on kind of a level playing field because everybody is on the screen. We have had, I think, four new folks added to that team over the past year, and they have been able to connect right away with the rest of the team where pre-COVID, it would have been once a quarter, you know, you would have had that opportunity for interaction. So it's definitely made that leadership team tighter and more connected. They benchmark and they share with each other best practice and, and offer support. And across the organization, we have divisions doing very different work. And so when that team comes together, we find things to talk about that in common are helping kind of across the board. So that's been a huge change for the better, I think, for that leadership team. Every time I think we might go to every other week or once a month, folks say, we'd really rather not. Could we just keep touching base every week? Because we share information and then we also have the opportunity to reinforce culture. You know, we open either with a word of prayer or a mission moment or an inspiration. I ask a different leader every week to kind of open the meeting. However, they center themselves. They are free to open the meeting that way. And then we close every meeting with reward and recognition. 
where leaders can recognize either somebody else in the meeting or just somebody else in the organization, somebody in the community, where we kind of celebrate what somebody has done for somebody else or even just, you know, what somebody has observed or what they're appreciative for. You know, we close with that gratitude. It makes a big difference in your outlook. So even when things were at their most concerning, most uncertain, we still close with gratitude and appreciation. And I think that that, again, kind of brought the team closer together. As you're saying this, and I'm thinking you packed a lot into that, what I have just observed is either getting used to the technology, getting used to the new whatever it is, because it's not new normal, it's something new. But what I heard was this, and what I've been reading and seeing when we talk about culture, I think things that you're talking about, those things that were important before and were maybe seen in a different way, have been dropped by a lot of people. You know, Rick always tells the story about asking how everybody's doing. Well, sometimes we forget. And if you're in back to back to back meetings, you forget to go, oh, wait a minute. That sounds to me very much I commend you for keeping that together. As you look back now, what are the things that you would, as a leader, do different? It is very impressive, the amount of people that are in your organization. So what can we learn from our leadership if we look back? I think just how far and wide you can spread that behavior. And I wish we had come up with the rules and the protocols very early in the process. Like if you were on any kind of a meeting like this with a lakey person, they're going to have their camera on because we've just said that is the rule. If you're participating in a meeting, you need to participate. You can't just kind of phone it in, be multitasking. You have to actually be present. You have to actually be dressed for work. You get very comfortable when you're working at home. And you have to remember that when you are on Zoom or you're still working, And if you come on site, you know, we've gotten very casual with work at home. And so when folks do come on site for certain reasons, you still have to remember that you're coming to work. So those are kinds of things that as leaders we have learned. And I will tell you, some leaders are still struggling with that. Just like all of our team members have different ways of work, ways that they prefer to work, our leaders have different ways that they prefer to lead. Some of our leaders are very big extroverts, so they wander around and they walk the halls. Rick has shared with me many times, that's how he likes to see people, is he likes to take different paths in different ways because he likes to just engage that way. And some of our leaders engage that way. Others are fine sitting behind their computer all day sending emails because that's the way that, that they lead. So I think we could have done a better job. We still could do a better job at teaching leaders how to lead in this environment because it's different. We have a practice here called the daily lineup, and it works a little bit different in every department because our folks, again, work differently. But when you can, the department gets together every morning or every afternoon, whenever you do your lineup and everybody reads a common message every day. You know, we are using that time to now most departments, if they're not working in person, if they're working remote, they're still doing their lineup every day at 11 o'clock, everybody hops on. And we've had to get creative because you don't have the same water cooler banter because everybody's not in the same room. You know, those are kind of skills that leaders, if they didn't do that lineup before in that manner, we've got to teach them how to do that. And we can be better. We still can be better than we are at helping leaders be prepared for this kind of new world. Because I don't think it's going to go away, Allie. I think even, you know, we are considering some of our folks may be permanent remote. Even without regard to that, like I said, we've got team members all over the country. So even if everybody in Pensacola came back to the office, I would still have thousands of people not in Pensacola. And so technology is, and meeting like this, is going to be part of our future. And so leaders have to, we have to prepare them for that. Allison, it's not too different from education, where technology has been there and that's what we've been doing. And you're right, now it's to embrace it and say, where do we go from here? We've been thrown into it, but what are the rules? I will tell you my one takeaway, shorten the meetings. Don't make them an hour because people will talk for an hour. If they're half an hour, we're gonna get to the point. And one of the other things that I noticed me doing is I don't put an agenda. I'm not as if I were going to a meeting and handing out things. That's my one takeaway that I need to do better so that everybody stays on task. Hopefully I'll do that in the future. 
Rick, do you want to add something to working remotely or? I feel like I'm in the courtroom and I need to say guilty because taking that 30 minute meeting and I think I, I maybe came up with the idea, let's shorten everything to 30 minutes. And so that gave me an opportunity. I love, we talked about the disc assessment some, but I love talking. So we'll say, well, we'll have a 30 minute buffer. And so I'll abuse that 30 minutes because I do miss the rounding. I called it where I would make my rounds and chat with people. I miss that part of having the honor of being in leadership for the College of Business to meet with the folks that I'm lucky enough to work with and get to know them a little better. But I think Allie makes such a great point to make the meetings more productive. And I don't know if you noticed this, Allison, but I miss drive time. I didn't realize so much, but we get where Zoom bumps up against Zoom, against Zoom, against Zoom. And the time I used to clear my mind, be driving to Rotary or to an appointment or a luncheon meeting, it gave me a few minutes to catch up on phone calls or to just think, or some days just let my mind rest because I, I'm mentally pretty tired. When you get four or five or six Zooms back to back, you're not quite as efficient. It'd be like watching the same moves four or five times. I see that. I think that's a, such a great point Allie made. Well, and, you know, I started sending emails to the leadership teams that, you know, on Friday afternoon saying, I don't know what you're doing this weekend, but you need to unplug and recharge. You know, this was in, in the midst of everything and there wasn't necessarily an end in sight. And I would just remind them, you know, it is a marathon, not a sprint. So you've got to take time. You don't need to have Zoom meetings back to back. We have really high PTO balances now for folks because they just haven't taken the time. And so I'm sending reminders saying, you know, have a great weekend. It's going to be beautiful outside. Just take some time for yourself because I need you recharged. I need you refreshed. I need you ready to come back Monday and kind of fight the same fight. And so I would send reminders, Rick, for folks to just make sure that they're unplugging because they need to and, and I need them to. That's a great, uh, another great point. I, I think I'm holding up a smartphone and they are not lying. It is smart. It's smarter than I am. But what it's done is I'm tethered to it and I'm doing emails and text messages. I really, I would 24 sevens, I do sleep sometime, but I mean, it gets so easy that you don't get a disconnect. So I commend you. That's, that's a mark of a leader to recognize that can't disengage and refresh mentally and physically. They won't be at peak performance when the next work day comes. And I might send an email because I'm the same way. If I have that thought at 2 a.m., I'm sending an email, but it usually starts with, do not answer this email until Monday. You know, I've just <laughs> captured my thoughts. I have no expectation that you are working and responding. Just because I had a thought doesn't mean you have to be there to respond. So if I know that I've sent it to somebody who might, I'm very clear, do not answer this. Do not work on this. I just didn't want to lose the thought. I think it's interesting. I used to be notorious for when I first became dean for the four o'clock a.m. emails. And the provost wrote me back early on, uh, maybe at 4.15, and he said, look, if you're up this early, I start about four in the morning, so that if you really need something, this is a much better time to catch me. So I'll read them. And I usually used to preface by that, but Allie and I have exchanged emails different times. And I think my thought is if I'm awake, I, I need to check and see if something's happened. And and you know, Rick, the other thing you just said is that's when you were re email so others kind of followed your habit. So that's another thing that I try to pay very close attention to. Like if I'm going to be off on Friday afternoon, I usually start my email saying, hey, I'm going to get out of here a little bit early today, or I'm going to be on PTO next week. So my message will be, I'm out of here for the Easter holiday. I hope you guys have a chance to do the same because they, your folks, you know, take their cue from you. If I'm here from sunrise to sunset, then they're going to feel like that's what my expectation of them is. So you have to model, you know, I have to just encourage that folks are practicing self-care and taking care of themselves and their families, you know, but you have to model that behavior or else people are kind of confused about whether your message is sincere or not. Allison, what a great example of leadership in action, because I, I like you, your preface was, I'm just sending this. I don't expect you to respond now because I my mind starts racing, apparently yours does, and I just want to get it out there. I didn't expect anyone to ever read those until the normal work day, but there is modeling. Mm -hmm. If they see me sending those, I could very easily be sending the message, I'm up, so you ought to be up. So I think that what I need to do is get a better system of when I have those thoughts, 
even if I want to prepare the email, put it over on my notepad, copy it, send great it. Great idea. That's a great so, idea. So I think uh, that I learned something really important today. So thank you. Yeah, no, me too. That's a great idea. I do a schedule send, by the way. This is just a note. While the two of you were talking, Rick's culture of caring is really where we've shifted, I think, into more of a college of business where it is caring, not that we weren't before, but that really is Rick. And as you know him, that's how he is. And that exudes from you as well, Allison. What I was thinking is, when do you as a leader learn that? When we're talking about you know, there's always opportunities to develop leadership. Can you share with us? Most people are not aware of it, but I'd love to hear that from you, especially for our listeners that are students. Can you help us with that? I can, because I actually had this realization not too long ago. I was doing a lunch with Allison last week and a team member asked me a question that made me kind of pause and reflect on a very similar question. By education and early in my career, I was in accounting and I am a pretty black and white kind of person. I wouldn't say I'm not a caring person, but I would just say I am the kind of person, just send me an email. You know, I don't have to wander around and see people like Rick, just send me an email and I'm good. I have always cared for people, but been very professional in that space. And this last year with the pandemic, It has made me much more aware about how much people need people. I mean, I've always needed people, but this has been different. Not being able to, maybe it's that I've always taken for granted, you know, that I see people and people around and and you kind of have those relationships. But when you can't see people, you know, I'm not much of a hugger. When I see you, we're probably, uh, before we probably were not going to hug. You know, but now I just can't wait to see people and, you know, I'm a much more of a hugger than I used to be. And I tell my team, I tell my team every Wednesday when we have our our meeting, you know, I close telling them how much I love them. And I close my emails to our team member wide emails that way, because that is how I feel. And after going through this past year where you just don't have that connection, it has impacted me in kind of that way that you can't miss those opportunities to be caring and create that environment. People have needed it. I have needed it this past year. And so, you know, that was kind of a big takeaway and a big aha moment. Self-reflection, you know, for sure. I was going to say, I think there's a little different level. How are you was such a rote question that we really didn't wait for an answer. It was just the next thing to say when we'd meet so often. And I don't mean we were superficial or uncaring, but I have found that we don't see each other and we hunger for interchange and just saying, I'm proud of you saying everybody turns a camera on. We've not been doing that. And I think we picked up on something really useful, but I think now when we get together, we really are concerned about how folks are doing. Uh, I think the pandemic and the, the Zoom, I used to call it Zoom a day and now it's Zoom an hour, but I think that culture has made us actually genuinely interested in how our colleagues, coworkers are doing. Well, you know, I can tell you which of my colleagues have pets because they kind of walk, their cat walks across the screen in the middle of the meeting, you know, or who has a dog that doesn't like when the mailman comes because he barks or, you know, who still has their Christmas tree up still this time of year, you know, you are the camera and these Zoom kind of meetings, you're invited into people's personal space. Now, sometimes we have to make sure that people are aware of their personal space and don't invite us in, you know, make your bed before you get on Zoom or whatever, but it's allowed conversations, much more personal conversations. I met somebody's grandbaby the other day via Zoom, which, you know, their grandbaby wouldn't have ever been at the office. I wouldn't have had that opportunity. And so I got to celebrate that with George and, and he was holding his new grandbaby so proud. I do agree with you, Rick, that the camera makes a big difference and it helps with that personal connection. You just learn things about people that you wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to. So I do think that it's going to help our organizations, but then how do we contain it, right? So now we're going back in and you do know these things, you know, it's kind of this odd thing. I am going to loop you back to who are big influencers? to you. Now, it could be like famous leaders or leaders that are not so famous, but 
are very impactful for you. Can you think of people that have impacted you along the way? So this might seem like just a pat answer, but I usually use my grandmother as the person that inspires me because she is an amazing person. She doesn't live here. She lives in Kentucky, but my grandfather was killed when I was very young and she raised, my mom obviously was out of the house, but there were five children. So she raised three of the five as a single parent in a time when you just weren't a single parent. She was the first female Eucharistic minister at the church there in her town. She was the first female vice president of the bank where she worked. She brought credit cards to banking and again in the industry when it just, it didn't happen. So she was just kind of a trailblazer and she was a, is, she still is living. She is a super giving person. She was on every board everywhere. She judged every baby contest at the county fair and the horse show. I mean, she just was super engaged and super involved. And so, you know, just a giving, a caring kind of person, but still could get things done. And so I watch what she could accomplish and try to take little pieces of that because she didn't necessarily grandstand for attention. She wasn't, people in town know her, but they just know her as, as June T. And, you know, she just gets things done. I called and send her flowers. She, we moved her to a nursing home in October and I just called the florist and I said, I need to send flowers to my grandmother. And they said, oh, well, she's at, they named the nursing home she was at. And I'm like, yes, she is. I didn't even have to give them the address or anything. They just kind of knew. So that is, you know, a life well-lived. You know, our family is super close. Like I said, my mom had five siblings and they all live in the same town. And to raise a family that can be that close and be that in a professional space and just philanthropic in the community, that's, you know, kind of a great role model. That's a great story. Rick, what about you as far as who has, what leader has influenced you the most in your younger days? I think... With all of the leader to leaders we've done, it's the first time you've asked me this question. I was reflecting that both of you were on the search committee when they were looking for a dean. And you probably heard me tell the story about my mother was in a bad automobile accident when I was 10 months old. And for the first four or five years of my life, she was learning to do the basic things like walk, talk. And I, she kind of, as I got a little older, raised me to be a daddy's boy. So I always really thought I was a daddy's boy. And so when I was reflecting about what my introduction to leadership was, it occurred to me that I probably was really a mother's boy because she influenced my life so much. And I told the story, but I think the first great lesson I had in trying to be a leader or thinking maybe I had leadership ability was she was in a wheelchair of the window in her bedroom and I was outside playing. A lot of the children came over to our house to play. And when I came in, she called me over and she put her arm around my waist and she said, I've noticed these children come over here and they kind of follow you. I notice if you go one way, they follow. And I want you to know something. I think you have this ability to be a leader. And I want you to remember that all of those children there, none of them are better than you. And I was thinking, that's pretty good. But she said, also, remember, you're no better than any one of them. And she gave me a list of things you do if you want to be a leader. And one of them was, she ended it, and you can always be kind. You can be kind. And I think I tried to start out being kind and thankful for having an opportunity to be part of leadership. So I would say my mother had a great impact, but my first law partner taught me so much. He was a mentor to me, but in my early life, I think I had a couple of teachers along the way that saw that I might be, I was an only child and maybe sometimes I was a little spoiled and that they saw in me a need to have a little more direction from mentors and they would take me under their wing. And I'm so lucky. I'm a product of the Pensacola or Scammy County Public Schools. We had great teachers when I was coming along and I would say my mother had a great influence. I had a great father. I don't mean to diminish that. He was and is my, he's been dead along since 1972, but he is still my hero. But teachers in the public schools taught me a lot. They care. I didn't get a free pass when it would have been just easier to say, well, he's just boy being a boy. That 50 years ago, that was kind of a pass occasionally. That's a long answer, but I think my mother 
and uh, Gallison's grandmother had a profound impact on me. I think both of those stories are great stories. And to leadership, sometimes we do get caught up in, you know, the latest buzz, whatever, do this, do that. But really what I'm hearing, it's just rooted in a lot of different things for different people. And a lot of caring is what leadership is about. So you can do the top 10 things, but when it comes from the heart, that is the place to start for both of you leaders. So thank you for that. Allison, one last thing I do wanna offer and I wanna thread it through. Again, you're part of our mentor program with Dr. Hartnett, you're a UWF graduate. We're coming up to graduation. It's a different world for our graduates. Could be better, could be worse, we don't know. What advice would you have if you could to our new graduates going out there as far as leadership and maybe something that we're not thinking about telling them or they forgot what they learned two semesters ago. I would love to hear it from your view of being a leader. What advice would you give to graduates? A great question. So I'm gonna have a graduate in April. I hope he listens to this podcast and takes this advice. I would tell your graduates to learn to say yes. This is something I did not learn early enough in my career. And now if this, like Rick called me yesterday, wants me to do something. And what I say, Rick, I said, yes, right? And what I mean by that is people are going to ask you to do things. They're going to ask you to be places. They're going to ask you to try things that are maybe outside your comfort zone, or maybe you don't think that you will be successful with. And if you don't just say yes and try those experiences, you miss out on a lot. You know, some of those yeses may lead to things that you regret and you're like, oh, how did I get into this situation? But a lot of those yeses are going to lead to new friendships, new mentors, new stories, new experiences that kind of shape your perspective on things. So I would just encourage new professionals in their career to just say yes and do and do new things, things that they think they may not like, they may not be comfortable with, they may be a little shy to try, but people are wonderful. People are really wonderful. When you get into situations you said yes to, you know, they'll help you out and they'll, they'll help you be a success. So just don't shy away from those opportunities. Because you don't know what it leads to. And That's exactly right. It exposes you to different type of leadership. When you were talking about the different leadership styles, they all fit in a team somewhere. It is. And so I love that. So thank you for that last piece of advice. Rick, Dean Fountain, I should say, you're going to have some advice for our new graduates going out. But just if you could give us a little peek into that as we close this podcast. It's hard to top what Allison said, but being open. And I was reflecting on Pat Craddock, was a partner in Dotson Craddock and born and was one of my early mentors. And I've had a lifelong passion for serving on nonprofit boards when they needed me. I did a lot of that. But he asked me to, invited me to be on the Red Cross board here. And I said, well, I've been out of college two years. I don't have any money. I don't, I really don't know much about that. And he said, this is a perfect board for you to start. He said, we're a United Way agency. But he, he mentored me through that. And I found a real passion. So I would say be open, not just say yes, but to be open to consider saying yes. If you shy away from people who might give you an opportunity, you may never get the question to answer yes to. And and I do want to say, Allison, you, you are very generous with your time and you do say yes. And I hope we never ask you to do something where that yes would be regretted because you're a great friend to not only the community, but in particular to the University of West Florida. We're proud to have you serve on different things with us and your leadership comes through in everything you do. Well, thank you for that, Rick. Very kind of you. You certainly earned that. So you're welcome. Thank you, Allison, for being part of what we're doing here at University of West Florida College of Business. Thank you, Dean, for your leadership and kindness. 